you literally had to go to the clubs to hear the music that you were into and, and really loved. Music is a connector. I was a soul ed. Everything got played back then. Soul, jazz, funk, disco, um, before uh, the term rare groove was used. Anybody that went to Crackers knows that that probably was one of the major foundations of the whole music scene. There were so many incredible dancers. The competition or the beef was, you know, who was the best dancer. The school never saw me on a Friday afternoon after the first time I went to Crackers. There were two people that, when we talk about Rare Groove, names, DJ names I have to mention. The first influential DJ for me was, it, it was all about dancing and um, and the music. They, they were the most important things. And if you were a good dancer, um, it was a little bit like you attracted the girls. Um, so dancing was a big part of the whole scene. And it was also just about just being in the moment and having that experience of, uh, I suppose, escapism from from whatever your life was. It was an all-inclusive vibe and scene. People from all different cultural backgrounds. Rare groove, soul, jazz, funk, disco was the foundation for all the dance music and the whole thing that we have here without a doubt that goes on now so ian we've we've only just met this afternoon um contacts were given through a mutual friend but it was a bit of a serum serendipity meeting yeah but i think uh, it was meant to happen because i was giving you your number by uh paul dsl dj dsl who you've interviewed and uh, we were meant to connect anyway and um, I have to give him a big shout out because he was the first person to put me on radio on his uh, internet radio station called Urban Jazz. No, oh, I mean he's been instrumental obviously in bringing us together. You were giving out flyers tonight for two events and I was giving out a flyer for one event and our paths kind of crossed. I'm there saying, oh, look, let's let's uh, share flyers. And uh, you took my number, and my number came up in your phone. Yeah, already had your number. So, so yeah, yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd already passed it on to me. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we connected even, even without um, having to contact each other. But it's a small world, and I think that everyone who you know was part of that era is connected anyway it's just you know with through facebook and through you know modern media those connections are not only being reaffirmed but some of the cross connections that were missed maybe the first time round are starting to sort of materialize so yeah it's no no coincidence yeah completely i mean the whole music scene is um music is a connector and we've probably been in the same club together and, and uh, not known each other. Well you've, you've already, like just before we, we turn the camera on, you've already mentioned I think three clubs, I mean two of which uh, were clubs I actually organised and one was gone clear. Um, so yeah we've definitely rubbed shoulders. So that would have been slow motion and uh, soul kitchen. S yeah so uh, both of those clubs were uh, clubs that I yeah, organised. Soul kitchen with Wiggles who is the front man and uh, slow motion um, and that was a collective which was Misty Oldland, Jake Narva and Ronald and Blaze and myself. Well, I know Ronald and Blaze and and, um, and and Wiggles, so there you go. A small world. There, there's there's all the connections coming out already. Now, I, I yeah, so I got a phone call from our mutual friend, and um, I was told, right, there's this uh, this guy, and I, I recognise your name from seeing you on so many flyers over the years. I'd love to hear your story. So. Basically, um, I come from um, 
my experience of music is going out as uh, bunking off a of school as a 14 year old kid going to crackers on a Friday afternoon and that was my musical education and anybody that went to crackers knows that that probably was one of the major foundations of the whole music scene that we've got going on here in terms of dance music and everything got played back then soul jazz funk disco um, before uh, the term rare groove was used really i mean rare groove is a term that was used post the rare groove scene anyway so when you know when the rare groove scene was happening it wasn't called rare groove no it wasn't but then um there were two people that when we talk about rare groove names dj names i have to mention and that is barry k sharp and norman j because norman used to run a night back at the base club in Shoreditch which became the Blue Note Club and the bass club was a, a jazz club and he used to do a Monday night there and it was called the original Rare Groove Show and some people say that Barry K Sharp was one of the first people to coin the phrase Rare Groove as well uh, and to, to and that's what he's known for really um, musically so yeah I just had I had to get that those, those names um, I think are important to credit when it comes to the rare groove genres and, and were both big influences on myself yeah and uh, I've already got uh, an interview um, yeah with Barry and I hope at some stage I'll be able to talk to Norman and get the you know the full behind the scenes story from uh, Norman as well okay I, so you've interviewed Barry yeah I've already had, I've, I've okay got, I haven't actually uploaded it but uh, yeah I've got a, a really nice interview with Barry oh, I look forward to hearing that and um, you know I worked with I worked with Norman actually at um, the the TARDIS party uh, it was at Dicky Dirt's in um, in Camberwell. Um, so yeah, m my path crossed with Norman when he was on Pirate Radio. Obviously, Kiss FM was Pirate Radio before it became the Kiss FM that we know now. And I just absolutely loved his um, his show. I can't remember what his show was called um, at that time. And I don't know how I got his number, but I managed to get his number via somebody else. And I phoned Norman up and I said, listen, I love your show. Would you would you like to team up and do an event? Um, and we teamed up and did um, the, the Dickie Dirt's Warehouse Party in Camberwell. So yeah, at some point I'd love to be able to sit down with Norman and um, recount those stories. So, your history it started around though then and these are your like influential DJs Do you remember? Uh, no the first influential DJ for me was um, George Power from Crackers and uh, he this was in a time when um, people were, were playing American imports and he was getting the latest stuff and literally after a Friday afternoon session at Crackers people would go down the road to Groove Records which was on also on um, Wardour Street same road as Crackers and would just buy the you know the tunes they just heard George play and George was the first person to give Paul Trouble Anderson the, his opportunity to DJ as well well, I, I don't know whether you know, but I've just posted an interview with uh, Christopher um, Harvey, um, and that was fascinating because he recounts, you know, his involvement with Crackers and his relationship uh, with George and how he started off sort of under George's wings. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, what is fascinating for me about this story is there are so many people with diverse backgrounds who all have a particular angle when it comes to this, what I'm calling the golden age. I mean, obviously you were there actually before I even came onto the scene. For some people, the crackers, the crackers time was the golden age, but I came onto the scene a little bit later. So the golden age for me was, you know, when I arrived on the scene, which was between 84 and I'd say 88. Um, while that the so-called rare groove scene was evolving. But what's occurred to me doing these interviews and talking to people like yourself is the diversity of opinions and the diversity of experiences when you actually you know, hear people's stories. And for me, what was actually really unique about the rare groove scene was it was a time when diverse people came together of all different backgrounds and just got down on the dance floor and there was no segregation there was no feeling that you couldn't get into the club um, everyone was just allowed into these you know underground clubs to just come and dance to brilliant music yeah it was all about the music and I mean school never saw me on a Friday afternoon after the first time I went to crackers literally as a 14 year old schoolboy and uh, yeah it changed my world and influenced me and and i was hearing music but back then you've got to remember there wasn't many pirate radio stations and uh, the only shows that you had on mainstream radio was robbie vincent and i think greg edwards playing our music so you literally had to go to the clubs to hear the music that you were into and, and really loved yeah. so yeah and, and I, something I come back to all the time is it was just purely about the energy on that dance floor. And that's what we live for as, as DJs and people going to the clubs. Yeah, completely. It, it was all about dancing and, um, and the music. They, they were the most important things. And if you were a good dancer, uh, it was a little bit like you attracted the girls um, so dancing was a big part of the whole scene and it was also just about just being in the moment and having that experience of uh, I suppose escapism from from whatever your life was and it was an all-inclusive vibe and scene people from all different cultural backgrounds um, and various jobs um, it was all about the music so for instance I grew up in the area where it was soul patrols so different areas had a soul patrol and you were part of that soul patrol and you would go to the clubs and represent your area being part of that particular soul, soul patrol now we are literally driving through Mitcham now and it's a coincidence because my first, um, rather than forming a soul, soul Patrol or joining a Soul Patrol, I formed my own, which we called the Mitcham Funk Department. And that's because I went to school in Mitcham. And um, yeah, the, 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 they were the, the big influence for me in local, South London was uh, the Wimbledon Soul Incorporation, which was the guys who were going to the clubs, but a couple of years older. So they were the ones that influenced us, who would, who would um, bring the music back, um, the, new, the latest dance moves and the fashion as well, because it was very tribal back then. And you, you know, depending on what music he was into was, was how you dressed, for instance. So I was a soul ed, and so you dressed and the fashion changed on the regular, the dance moves changed weekly. And, and, and so, you know, the new releases and the music. So it was a whole scene that, you know, you were part of.
yeah and the the energy on the dance floor i mean i'm not a i'm not a dancer like you i've never pretended to be a dancer i was never good at dancing but what i what, when i played this music the energy that it, it created on the dance floor symbiotically i was absorbing that you know whether it was in my soul i felt as though i was part of the dance floor even though i can't you know dance like the best dancers uh, you know I'm, I'm what you would call a dad dancer i'm an awkward white guy who was brought <laughs> up on you know led zeppelin and pink floyd and i was never exposed to music or f what i call funky music you know when i was much younger but you know when i as i played this music and as i saw the reaction on the dance floor you know i became addicted to finding more and digging deeper and finding those oddball and quirky tunes that gave that told a story on the dance floor and, and to me the rare groove you know it paints different textures you know with house music you're mixing in the 4-4 four, four beat yes every record's slightly different it's got little different phrases but with rare groove you know you're going from 80 bpm right up to 130 bpm and you've got every genre of music in between and someone said to me tonight which i thought was quite poignant they, they used the word, I think it was actually um, Nikki Confusion um, who said uh, to me tonight that the DJs back then used to do what she called cherry picking and to me that's it wasn't just the rarity of the grooves, it was the ability to find these grooves on each album and cherry pick the ones you wanted to tell the story yeah no completely and um i think it still is as, as a dj as well in terms of um playing music because it's about um choosing um the certain tracks off of for instance that album that um that works um for instance the whole northern scene soul scene happened because of um the B-sides, it was about playing stuff that was, um, that wasn't being played anywhere else. For me, I'm not a big Northern Soul fan because um, they were a B-side for a reason. Um, I'm a more of a groove merchant, so any genre of music that I play, it has to have a groove. But the whole rear groove soul jazz funk disco was the foundation for all the dance music and the whole thing that we have here without a doubt that goes on now today it was happening back in the day so literally the soul scene had all dayers had weekenders uh, it was pre-festival it was it was laying the foundation to everything that we have going on now that was happening back then and we're talking you know late 70s beginning of the 80s i mean i came in at crackers but there were clubs before that like embassy and global village but crackers most people would say was and george power was really instrumental with forging like so many well-known DJ names now who are relevant in music now came through that whole went to crackers came through the whole um, soul jazz funk and rear groove scene and, and that's what they started off playing and I mean who your recollections of some of the dancers because again what we're doing is we're talking to know people I mean you obviously evolved from the dance floor to also loving the music so much and DJing and buying the records um, and you know the scene wouldn't be the scene without the dancers because it's the dancers and I always say it's all about the dancers the dancers are for me what you know fueled my journey to find records you know that fired that fired the dancers so there was this kind of call it the positive loop you know the energy came back off the dance floor that drove you to go and dig for records the next week with the little tiny bit of money that you'd make often 
well most of the time it was like less than 50 quid or 50 quid at the absolute most and then you'd spend that money to find the records for the next week on that 50 pounds so you know in those days you go around all the record and tape exchanges in those days you could pick up 12 inches like US import 12 inches that weren't really wanted they were just chucked down in the basement of record and tape exchange I think the top price was 60p and you know some of them were marked at um, 20p so you could come back with like bags full of uh, records if you did the rounds at the right time just as they put out the new stock so yeah I really want to also you know talk to I mean as I said you 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 come from the dance background as well can you mention some of the names of the people that you you know you absorbed energy from on those dance floors well my my first memory and one of my favorite dancers was Paul Anderson because he was a dancer before a DJ he was a trendsetter um he came with new moves every week and I before I even knew him I just you know if he touched the dance floor him and Freddie a circle would form around and people would watch and it was all about challenging and showing off how good you could dance back then so you know it 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 was the the competition or the beef was you know who was the best dancer um and there were many dancers um back in the day who were um uh, just as good or, or even better than paul but for me him and freddie they stood out as a 14 year old boy going to crackers watching the moves and then going home and trying to copy that and then ready to go down to, to, to try and drop them the next week and then they've already moved on with some new moves and and it was, yeah, it was always changing. So, um, but yeah, there was so many amazing dancers. I have to call out people like Trevor Shakes, Mohammed, um, Leon, um, uh, Leon Herbert. Um, there's this. There were so many incredible dancers um, that that was yeah setting the trends and and uh, it was all about the music, fashion, and the dance. But the dance floor was yeah what it was all about. Um, and you couldn't, you couldn't, if you were a good dancer, you would get challenged on the dance floor as well. And you had to be ready to drop some moves because all of a sudden, if someone challenged you on the dance floor, that was it. A circle would gather around and... Um, you were in the spotlight. And you was in the spotlight and you had to be able to pull out some moves, otherwise it was all over. So as a 14-year-old, did you feel intimidated? Were you like crafting your own style in the background before you let rip and I, ent I, I, entered the challenge? Or I, you... I, I, I never even touched the dance floor as a 14-year-old. Uh, there was no way. I was just watching and uh, learning. Absorbing the energy. Absorbing it, going home and practicing. But yeah, go, maybe dancing in my local clubs. Um, and did you ever feel confident to to be part of the like in in the circle dancing? Didn't not you? not so much in the circle, but in terms of it had such an influence on my life that I formed a dance group um, called Silk Cut, spelt with a K in cut. Uh, there were three of us: myself, uh, Basil Isaac, uh, who's known as Basil Black to Basics, who's uh, amazing dancer, DJ and percussionist um, and a guy called Chamela um, and yeah we used to perform um, we were none of us were trained dancers but we'd go and work out and uh, we'd perform at different shows and uh, events um, there used to be a lot of um, for instance um, um, fashion shows back in the day for um, for the African and Caribbean um, 
for instance, place uh, people like Hair, Hair and Beauty magazine and stuff would have different um, fashion shows. So we'd perform at places like that and various clubs, but none of us were trained. We all came from the street and from 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 club dancing. So yeah, when I was younger, I wanted to be a dancer. And a lot of the club dancers used to get picked up by the talent scouts who were looking for people to make their TV shows look good or their videos look good. They'd actually go round the clubs and pick people out or invite them. Were you ever invited to do like videos, pop videos? Um, well, uh, not so much invited. The only video I was in as, as a dancer was um, Barry K. Sharp's um, master plan video. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of dancers, yeah, were were performed in different dance groups. Um, like, for instance, Torso was one of the most popular dance groups at the time. They were often um, performing on Top of the Pops and and in, in different videos for for various um, pop groups. So yeah, yeah, the, it was very much. Uh, coming from the street, my I went into the whole jazz dance scene. So um, we used to go to a club um, run by Paul Murphy um, at the uh, Horseshoe in Tottenham Court Road called Jaffers, and um, he really kind of laid the foundation for jazz dance um, pre Giles Peterson. Um, and yeah, that was just yeah a whole another scene of really fast footwork, and then that kind of evolved into uh, the Jazzy Funk Club with George Power and Paul Chubb Lanson at the Electric Ballrooms, and they'd ha they'd have a jazz room upstairs where Paul Murphy first played, and then Giles and various other DJs. So you had two rooms going on: the Soul and Boogie Room, and then the Jazz Room as well. Yeah, I, I used to uh, have a phrase for that style of dancing. I used to call it Hellfire Footwork. In fact, I used the phrase Hellfire Footwork on a, a couple of our early Wicked Pulse flyers because um, Jerry from IDJ used to be a great support to just about every event I did. And he, he'd always you know, take a, a pile of the flyers and then distribute them to the, some of the best dancers in London. He was like east, west, north, south. He'd be everywhere. So he was kind of like your social, social media um, guru in those days because he just knew everyone and he was so well connected. So if you gave some flyers to Jerry, all the dancers from north, east, south and west would come to, the, come to your events. Oh yeah, completely. I mean, for me, Jerry and I DJ, but especially Jerry was one of the best jazz dancers out there, without a doubt. Um, and uh, I DJ, you know, performed all over. Um, they were going to Japan. Um, they performed at one of the um, world music um, um, charitable what was it called? The ones that they were doing, organised by um, Bob Geldof. They were doing, you know, stuff like that. They were performing with with uh, jazz pioneers like Art Blakey. So yeah, yeah, it was a real, real scene. And Jerry was completely foundation um, for the whole jazz dance thing. And for, in my opinion, one of the best. So, um, what I always ask people to do is, um, you know, partly I'm doing this series of interviews to record the, the legacy and hopefully one day, it, you know, we'll be able to pass the baton down to the next generation. But for the people that weren't actually there, could you bring a couple of your most memorable nights alive by just walking us through the nights, your memories, the smells, the sounds, the people, the fashion, your feelings, emotions. Wow, uh, I mean that's that's 
a, a really hard question to answer or to, to convey in terms of because uh, there's been so many memorable nights and, and occasions um, from when I was younger right through to, to even now but what I can do is include some of my favourite clubs um, um, that we used to go to back in the day so we, we had places like Cheeky Pete's we had um, Spats on Oxford Street we had Gossips uh, on Dean Street which was before Gossips was called Billy's um, we had obviously the Wag Club um, there was um, uh, Barracudas um, there was I never went to the Embassy or Global Village but they were really well known venues prior to my me coming onto the the scene as a 14 year old um, and um, oh yeah there's some of the, the, the clubs that I remember off the top of my head as a youngster going out to that that, that was very kind of um, early foundational um, nights and, and, and clubs because back in those days with the soul music scene it was a scene where you could go out every night of the week to a different club and hear your music um, and it was it was a scene that where as I said to, to hear that music you had to go to the clubs because it wasn't being played in the music and uh, on the radio and various there was you had to go to those certain nights because they were the only nights that you would get into because if you went to those same clubs on a different night that wasn't playing that music you weren't even allowed in if you was a person of colour so that was the era that mm. I grew up in and, and experienced um, so yeah yeah I hope you don't mind I'm just going to push you for one memorable because I just love it when people get absorbed by that almost eureka moment. All right, well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you one significant moment for me. I mean, there have been many and it would be hard to choose. But my life-changing moment uh, was when I arrived for the first time ever. This was a long time before the rare groove scene. This was Camden Palace at Rusty Egan and St Steve Strange's night. And uh, we'd been tipped off that it was this great night. Didn't know, didn't know what to expect. My experience of like clubs was, you know, school disco or college disco in back in those days. And I think the the, the transforming moment in my life where I realised there was a whole another world out there was on, when I walked in at balcony level from the Camden Palace because you'd actually come in front door. And then you walk down this long corridor at the side and then you come in and then suddenly there was just this absolutely incredible gathering of a thousand, two thousand people. And it was like entering the carnival of life that you'd never known existed. And I think that was the first moment when I realised there was a world outside, you know, my little bedroom listening to, you know, Pink Floyd and getting together with mates and, you know, hearing... Led Zeppelin and that kind of music there was suddenly this whole new world that sort of opened up to me and that that began my journey I mean it's a very long journey but that was kind of a, almost like the revelation of wow this is another world I can connect with and I didn't know existed so yeah it's, it's really sort of finding those moments in life when you you just felt this this is going to take me on a on a life journey have you, have you ever had one of those kind of moments? I mean, you've mentioned crackers. Well, that for me was the club, crackers. Yes. That was it. As a 14-year-old, you know, after experiencing that, it was a different world. And completely, that's, that's then taken you that, on, that, your, that's on your journey. That was the beginning of me and me getting into the whole music, fashion, that the whole nine yards. Because 
as a 14 year old experiencing for one i don't know how i got in i must have looked about 12 at the time um so i don't know how i got in and to just see the most hear the most amazing music see the, some of the best dancers it was just a whole nother world and it was incredible so yeah without a doubt crackers was was that for me as a 14 year old exper experiencing um yeah something uh that that was um life-changing in that sense and obviously that that stayed with me because I'm I'm still into music and I still collect records. And, and you're still promoting and putting on and, events. And and, uh, and I've I've got my own flyer pack called Soul Pack that I developed, which was developed specifically for the world soul, jazz, funk, disco, and electronic dance music genres. Um, Is that I, still going right now? That's well, I tried to knock it on the head after lockdown because I was like I can't see this ever coming back and there I was today with a handful of flyers when I met you yeah absolutely and doing, damn, doing the same thing damn I need to put my London Rare Groove party flyers in your pack so we need to talk business yes yeah definitely and um, yeah all, everything I do I'm an event coordinator so I still work within the industry now it's revitalizing after um after what we've just been through the last couple of years um and yeah basically um marketing promoting putting on events um i also offer um an artist liaison service where i that's why i got this car I'm known as the driver as well as the flyer guy um so I, I pick up um, for work for different promoters, bringing in international artists and DJs. I do the airport pickups, take them to the hotel, to the gig and back. So I get to meet some legendary people on, on a personal level as well. Um, and um, yeah, still very much has been a very big influence on my life from um, what, what I'm involved in now and still do. And my passion is DJing and, and, and record collecting still. And wow, so like we're sitting in a car that must have heard so many good stories that should be part of the untold story of Rare Group. Well, that, well, let's leave that for part two because I've got so many stories that I could tell. All right, well, and, we'll... and I've driven um, a real kind of who's who in dance music. All right, well, yeah, well, let's do, let's do a follow-up to this interview. I'd absolutely love to do that. Um, but just to finish off with, uh, let's hear about your up and coming events. Um, please tell everyone where you're going to be DJing, where your events are, where they can find you and uh, what you've got up and coming. So um, all my handles, uh, Insta, DJ Soul Provider, all one word, uh, spelt with a Y uh, and Facebook. Um, Ian Milne, DJ Soul Provider, so you can um, catch me there. Um, on the socials, that's the platforms I'm on. Um, I've also developed a, a, a social media app um, that we're going to be launching this summer called I House You for electronic music lovers and househeads. Um, also, the gigs I've got coming up next week which is what's the weekend is it the 23rd 24th no sorry the 20 29th and 30th and the first um uh, that's april um, yeah uh, april of april yeah the, the end of this month um next weekend is uh, i'm at uh i'm at four to the floor is my dance collective so as Four to the floor on Instagram on Four to the Floor London, uh, the number spelt number four, and that's a collective of DJs, dancers, and music producers, um, and um, we're doing um, Next Door Records um, on Friday, um, this coming Friday, which is I'm not sure of the date of that, but I think it's the twenty eighth. 
28th or 29th and then on the Saturday um, I'm going to be at the Three Crowns in uh, that's Stoke Newington um, and then on the Sunday I'm at the POW uh, Prince of Wales in Brixton um, playing for Louis Vega's uh, out London album launch party of his new album um, that's that's being released um, at the end of the month as well so yeah you can catch me catch me there well it's been a real pleasure spending this half an hour with you uh, driving back from your gig and off up to Sutton to uh, drop one of your DJs off so thanks for taking time out uh, all the videos can be seen on raregroove.com which takes you straight through to the uh, the untold story of Rare Groove channel on YouTube and just to leave everyone with a kind of little teaser of an untold story because we'll get to the untold stories in the next one a little teaser in terms of teaser for the, the part two. Oh, for the part two okay uh oh gosh uh well firstly i'd, I'd um i'd like to thank you for for documenting uh our story because this is something that i think is really important to be um documented um to hear not just my um my experience but um you know um talking to all the the series of different people that you've spoken to so uh yeah big up for that um and one of uh yeah god there's, there, there's so many there's so many stories uh but a huge uh, i had the privilege of of driving um frankie knuckles before he uh he passed on and he was um, probably known as one of the godfathers of house music uh in america and uh, he was doing a, a, a gig in london and he was probably one of the nicest guys i've met and you kind of understand why he does so well and uh, not just music wise but you know why he was so such a you know uh well respected and and uh, you know done so much within the industry because he was genuinely just a, a a nice guy um in in the industry that you can imagine can be full of egos Great. Well, again, thanks so much for uh, spending this time with me. And uh, I look forward to part two. Myself included.